This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Good evening. My name is Marsha Landolt. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School, and it's a distinct honor to welcome all of you to this evening's Dan's Lectureship. Um, we're here tonight because of an enormously generous gift to the University of Washington that was made in 1961 by John Dance and his wife, Jessie. The University of Washington has benefited now for exactly 40 years from this wonderful gift that has allowed us to bring outstanding speakers to the University of Washington and to the greater Seattle area. Mr. Dance and his wife specifically wanted us to be able to bring those men and women who concern themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. And I think you'll agree that tonight's speaker, Dr. Vandana Shiva, uh, is a good example of that. Dr. Shiva is going to be introduced tonight by a member of our faculty. Dr. Nana Javeri is, uh, received her PhD from Clark University in 1999. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Geography. And her present research examines the role of law in regulating environmentally significant consumption practices. Her work focuses particularly on the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Regional Alliance. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Nana Javari. Good evening. Um, for most of us in this hall, our guest today, Dr. Vandana Shiva, needs no introduction at all. It is my deepest honor to welcome her to Seattle and the university this evening. Vandana Shiva has long been an inspirational and persistent voice against globalization and environmental destruction. Since the early 1980s, as a world-renowned intellectual and activist, she has provided us with an incisive eco-feminist analysis of how masculinist science and development models have led to the monoculturalization of our food systems. The inspirational power of her work goes further than just critique by creatively mobilizing support for organic agricultural practices. In particular, she has drawn attention to upholding the collective knowledge systems that for centuries have promoted diverse ecologies in India. She advocates an approach that is based on the principle of ahimsa, meaning nonviolence or harmlessness. This draws on the ethics of ecological and feminist thought that promotes diversity and pluralism in knowledge, action, nature, and culture. Now, following her doctoral work in the philosophy of science in the late 1970s, Dr. Shiva did research at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And then, in 1982, inspired by the Chipko movement, she established the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology in her hometown of Dehradun in the foothills of the Himalaya. From that time on, she has moved from strength to strength. In 1991, she founded Navdanya, a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources by setting up community seed banks, supporting conversion to organic agriculture, and establishing direct producer-consumer links for food security and safety. In 1993, recognition of her pioneering, pioneering work came at the highest level when she won the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize, also called the Right Livelihood Award. More recently, Vandana Shiva has launched a global movement called Diverse Women for Diversity and was also a founding member of the International Forum on Globalization. On this visit, she brings new tidings that she has started a green college in Dehradun based on Gandhian principles called Bij Vidyapit. She has shared her understanding and knowledge through her many books with the latest just out called Tomorrow's Bi Biodiversity, which is available outside at the stands. And today, the title of her lecture is Ahimsa, 
beyond violent traditions of science and technology. I just want to say that at the end of the lecture, um, if you have questions, please do come to the two microphones up here at the front. Um, but otherwise, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Vandana Shiva this evening. I want to thank you very warmly, and I want to thank Seattle for being there. <laughs> and you need a place on this earth to give you an excuse to join our energies. Gave it two years ago, it's giving it again. And I'd like to thank the Dance Fellowship, <laughs> the Dance Endowment for giving me this opportunity to return to this place which has become, for those who care deeply about democracy and real freedom, a kind of pilgrim center. And while I'm paying homage to the amazing energies that were unleashed here and have been maintained uh, since the failed WTO meetings, I don't know how many of you read the USA Today today. <laughs> They're preparing with 75 federal agencies all the way from the Army's Biological Warfare Office, the Coast Guard, and the CIA for something that couldn't be anything less than a war. But the war is against the assumption that something called the foot and mouth disease might arrive in the United States. They're preparing with arrangements for earth-moving equipment to bury thousands of animal carcasses, and drafting of emergency orders that could suspense environmental regulations to allow quick burial of afflicted livestock. Now, I'm sure you all have seen the images over the last two months on TV of the similar military operations mobilized in the United Kingdom, where sheep and cattle are being shot and then burned, hundreds and thousands. They've identified 500,000 animals for culling within the next few months. Now, such a mass ecocide for something called the foot and mouth disease, which in my area in the small villages, they cure with the most amazing diversity of crops, the um, buckwheat, the root paste of buckwheat, the peach, the young shoots. About 20 plants are available to cure this non-fatal viral infection. Of course, it's very infective, but it's not fatal. It doesn't kill animals. It does no harm to humans. And usually it passes after a month of lowering yields of milk and lowering the animal energy of cattle that pull your bullock carts and pull your plows. It's the first time in history that just for having an infection, we are ready to annihilate livestock on this scale. But this notion of zero tolerance to disease, which is what is defining this massacre, um, is behind what a manageable illness is, uh, is being now called a fearful plague, a demon, a serial killer, if you please, and a predator at large. And it's this idea that all of nature, with the inevitability of disease, the fact that there will always be disease, that all of us will have some kind of disease or the other, um, that that intolerance to the state of affairs of diverse pests, of diverse plants, maintained within limits, within balance, it's that intolerance that is turning our entire science technology structure, especially around food and agriculture, into zones of warfare. The way we are producing our food on our farms, the way we are processing it, the way we are distributing it, the way we are managing the knowledge around it, at every step it has become warfare. 
one wouldn't need to define technological tools, gene guns, if we weren't thinking about the genetic basis of life and its manipulation as warfare. We wouldn't be creating chemicals that wipe out life's diversity and give them the names like Roundup and Avenge and Squadron and Prowl. And that's just a little sampling. I'm sure your shelves have many more. And the violence of, of science and technology structures is something that we haven't been trained to see. Because we've been told it's neutral, it's facts, it's that amazing Cartesian escape from any doubt, any certainty, any solidity. Everything of real property is reduced to secondary. All the fictitious constructs about what the world is made of, constructs like measurements of length and height and breadth and weight, turned into the primary qualities. That escape from a world in all its multiple dimensions, its flavors, its sounds, its smells, its forms, has been turned into a, a world of which the people who want to control it are so afraid. And it's that fear of everything free, everything living, everything shaping itself and its evolution on its own terms that is creating the kind of tools of warfare that we see emerge around us. And once you've created panic out of something like foot and mouth disease, you can justify the worst forms of violence because you've made it a serial killer. And you must annihilate the serial killer. You've made a weed in your field a major threat to your existence. And you must find the most vicious instruments to wipe it out. I remember when we were having debates around uh, genetic engineering in the biosafety protocol, one of the publications put out by Monsanto talked about weeds as stealing the sunshine. <laughs> now, that's possible. <laughs> if anyone could reduce the amazing solar energy that's available to the world, we could have five planets more. That's one thing that we will never be short of. But it is also that same fear of everything alive and everything free also then generates tools that create scarcity with the excuse that they're creating abundance. Another element of, of this violence that comes from fear, and violence, I believe, only comes from fear. There's never been violence on the part perpetrated by those who are unafraid. In fact, nonviolence is the trait of absence of fear. Violence is the trait where fear is the pervasive quality. And that fear also creates this amazing shrinkage of awareness of what the impacts of action are. Yeah? You've identified foot and mouth disease as danger, you've got to shoot every cattle on the horizon. In England, they are killing cattle that aren't infected on the assumption that they might get infected. The impact of those actions are not assessed. And another reason we get violence emerging from fear is when you've locked yourself so much in a corner that you don't see the tremendous alternatives that make alternative actions possible. Nonviolent action possible, compassionate action possible, compassionate thought possible. And it's this triple level of violence, of the fear of everything free of that which you can't control, that which you can't subjugate, of refusing to assess what your attempts at subjugation and colonization do, and refuse to admit there are other ways of relating to the planet and its species and to other humans. That is creating this accelerated excuse to have violence where it's not totally unnecessary. The zero tolerance syndrome is not just of disease, it's a zero tolerance to diversity. 
And uh, for those of you who've been following the genetic engineering debate, you'll notice that everyone of us could be defined as having a genetic problem. My problem is I have the OB gene, which is the obesity gene. <laughs> it's not lack of walking, it's not lack of exercise. It's that OB gene they found in the rats. <laughs> and someone else, of course, will probably have uh, the, the slim gene. Someone else has a dwarf gene, and someone else has the tall gene. Now, you know, that wonderful, fictitious, perfect person just doesn't exist. But creating that fiction of a perfect person, the perfect farm, the perfect fruit, allows us then to spray our apples to be just the right shape and size, our vegetables to have that fake cosmetic appearance, no matter how loaded they are with poisons and toxics and dirt. And that rationality is what gave us the real problem with cows, not foot and mouth disease, but that fatal mad cow disease. You know, cows were meant to graze freely. It wasn't efficient. So they decided to take diseased cows, diseased sheep, which had scrapey, grind them up to the perfect scientific assessment of being the right protein and the right minerals, right calcium, ground it up in these amazing plants called rendering plants. They never told you they were, what they were rendering into what. And that's the other amazing part of our stage. You know, we deal with uh, what are called transitive verbs without anything connecting them. So you have rendering plants, you have economies in transition. <laughs> well, the rendering plants, of course, look very, very impressive. They're like cement factories. And if you look merely at the assessment of the sophistication of tools and technology, yeah, they're big, giant-sized, only good could come out of them. but they were just brilliant in the wrong kind of way. Because not only did they do violence to cattle by turning herbivores into carnivores, they fed the cattle, infected meat, not just meat, but infected meat, which then created violence all the way up the food chain, turning cows into mad cows and people who ate the beef into victims of the new variant of CJD, the equivalent of the mad cow in human beings. And if you were to look at the meat, it's all fine. It's the same thing. It's just that the protein is slightly twisted. The structure's different. It is substantially equivalent in that very famous style <laughs> of the biotech debates. But it's not ecologically equivalent. It's not health-wise equivalent. And it's these improved feeds and improved seeds that were supposed to bring benefit to the cows, and the farmers, and are wiping out both. That's what science and technology was supposed to do for us. Improve our lives, create better well-being, more abundance, and yet the very beneficiaries of the technology are having to be exterminated. The cows, in the ways we've seen, but not just cows, farmers too. Since 1991, India, under structural adjustment pressures, started to change her economic policies towards trade liberalization, which meant liberalized investment, liberalized imports, liberalized exports. Liberalized investments meant we could no more control the seed companies that came in. Earlier, 80% of our farmers used to save their own seeds. In just 10 years, that proportion has absolutely changed. And not only are farmers not saving their seed, the public sector seed companies have been wrapped up. Small seed companies in India have all been bought up by the Cargills, which have been bought up by the Monsantos, the Syngentas, and they use the most amazing marketing techniques 
to get their new hybrid seeds onto the farms of subsistence farmers. Hybrid seeds, as you know, again, technological brilliance. As Cargill said in 92, when we were having major uh, farmers' actions around Cargill, and the farmers had torn down the Cargill plant in Bellary at that point, you might remember. Cargill said that the farmers were so foolish, they didn't understand that they had created these smart technologies that prevented the bees from usurping the pollen. Because the hybrid, hybridization basically is, uh, you know, replaces pollination, open pollination, and creates varieties that do have hybrid vigor in the first generation, but you can't save them, and therefore farmers must buy them every year. But in addition to not being saved, they're also extremely vulnerable to pests. And they require a lot of irrigation. So a peasant who was doing subsistence agriculture, growing their own food, maybe growing a few chilies to sell, a little bit of turdal to sell, was lured into buying hybrid cotton seeds in the areas around, particularly around Andhra Pradesh, Warangal, Mahbubnagar, Anandpur, and in Batinda in Punjab. The same companies that sell the seeds also sell the pesticides. And not only do they sell the seeds and pesticides, structural adjustment has meant that cooperative credit lending has disappeared because there's no refinancing of cooperative banks in rural areas. And the corporations give credit for buying the pesticide and the seeds through their partners at the local level. Who would their partners be? We were told globalization is good. Just like Marx had said, colonialism is good because the East India Company will destroy our societies and out of it something wonderful will emerge. But the same thing about globalization, it's supposed to destroy the inequalities of our societies and out of which a new global citizenship will emerge. It doesn't work that way, because global corporations partner with a local landlord who's also the local money lender and also has the agency for pesticide and seed sales. There are villages where you find no shop except a pesticide and seed shop. And within a year or two, a farmer who has no money is in debt of 100,000 rupees, 200,000 rupees, 300,000 rupees. In addition, the cotton they were told would create, would make them millionaires, nothing less. Uh, and it was brought to them right from heaven above. Hanumanji, you know, the monkey god who saved Lakshman in the Ramayana. Hanumanji sells their seeds. Guru Nanak ji sells their seed. Um, in every part of, you know, we have a huge diversity of gods. <laughs> and they've mobilized all of them into being their sales piece, people. You know, I've visited these villages when suicides have happened, and I've talked. I'll talk to the woman and say, why on earth did you go in for these seeds? And she says, the video was so amazing. It was even better than the Ramayana on TV. <laughs> so you use the deepest of mythic beliefs of the people to get the improved seeds. Peasants know they can't pay back these loans. They can't get out of this debt. They drink the same pesticides that have gotten them into debt and commit suicide. And I'm not talking one or two. I'm talking about districts with a thousand suicides in a year. Our studies, and I have outside a few copies of our most recent report called The Seeds of Suicides, the Ecological and Human Costs of Globalization of Agriculture. It's basically about how the seed sector has changed in India. And in every one of these villages, it's an epidemic. I was called in by national TV the other day because there had been five suicides in one village. And the reporter was in that village and talking and asking for the explanations of why this is happening. And while she was asking a question, another dead body was brought in. Our assessment is 20,000 farmers since 1997. And we are making a very rough, very distant assessment. It's a violence no one took into account. It still doesn't show up in those brilliant promises of how globalization is supposed to lift all boats, you remember? The small and the big. Pesticide use in these regions has gone up by 2,000%. The worst of technologies is spreading the fastest. 
because the worst of technologies is not just more profitable, it is creating this amazing expansion, permanent expansion of markets. Because the more pesticides you apply, the more pests you have, therefore the more pesticide you can sell. Ecological failure is a market miracle. And this has been made so evident in the recent decision of March the 29th, just a few weeks ago, in the courts in Canada, which ruled in the case that Monsanto had filed against Percy Schmeitzer, a farmer in Saskatoon, uh, for stealing their genes. Their genes that were protected by patent 1313830 for a Roundup resistant canola. Now, Percy has been growing canola for 50 years with his own seed stock. And in 1997, he found that his canola was starting to get polluted with Roundup Ready canola. Part of it being brought in by the wind, some of it being brought in by um, trucks going past on the highway, part of it through pollination. He never bought the seed from Monsanto. He never took the seed from his neighbors. He never stole it from anyone. It arrived in his fields through pollution. Now, the judge has ruled that even though Monsanto collected the samples from Percy's fields through theft, because they hired a detective agency called Robinson Investigation, whose employee, Dr. Wayne, went in secretly to just take canola from his farm. The judge has actually ruled that the samples taken are not illegal, that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that says that anyone whose rights and freedoms have been infringed can ap appeal to the courts and that no court can have evidence based on illegal collection of, of facts. The judge has ruled, because this case is so important for intellectual property rights, narrower notions of Percy's property in terms of his land, an encroachment into his land does not count. They then go on to rule that it doesn't matter how the genes came to be in Percy's fields that they could, and they did, come through the wind. And let me read this out for you. Because what we are seeing in this judgment has importance for all of us, not just Percy. They go on to say that the patent, which lasts up to February 23rd, 2010, gives Monsanto the exclusive right, privilege, and liberty of making, constructing, using, inventing, and selling to others the patented gene. And the judge acknowledges that the seed and the plant containing the patented gene may be illegally owned by the farmer, but the farmer has no right to seed that has the genes and the cells that are patented. You remember that interesting story of Merchant of Venice? Where the claim to a pound of flesh prevented injustice? Here it's just the opposite. You own the gene, you own the pound of flesh, and then you own the whole human being. You say the seed belongs to Percy, that's fine, but the gene belongs to Monsanto, and wherever the gene occurs, even if it's in the scene, it belongs to Monsanto. Thus, a farmer whose field contains seed or plants originating from seeds spilled into them, blown as seed from a neighbor's land, or even growing from germination by pollen, carried into his field from elsewhere by insects, birds, wind, may own the seed or plants on his field, but not the genes in it. And then they go on to say, this is not comparable to the stray bull that comes and impregnates your cows, and you are liable for the pollution. Because this is not about property, normal property, it's about intellectual property. And that has a different quality to it. It's, again, let's go back to the Cartesian escape. Yeah. 
objective knowledge was supposed to have been a different quality of knowledge. And it, it had the power then to destroy, disentitle, uh, uh, disenfranchise people with knowledge that was embodied, embedded, and contextualized. Well, Percy has been fined. He's asked, been asked to pay beyond the $200,000 that he has already spent. He's been asked to pay $105,000 as the profit he would have earned from 97 onwards for this canola crop, as well as a fine of $15 per acre for the 1998 crop. We are, those of us who've been involved in, um, in defense of farmers' rights, in the resistance to uh, uh, corporate monopolies on life on earth, are basically calling for helping Percy in every way we can. We've set up a farmer's fund. We set it up for the farmer's suicides in India also, uh, because we had a public hearing, a tribunal, and we realized uh, that individual farmers can't take these corporations on. We've got to work together. And for those of you who would like to support Percy in any way, let me just uh, tell you that IFG, the International Forum on Globalization, whose agriculture program I'm chairing currently, we've set up the Farmers Emergency Fund through which we will provide whatever support we can to Percy. Um, and their email is ifg at ifg.org. And uh, the website is www.ifg.org. I don't know this stuff you can figure out, and that's why I don't know how our website, our institution, hooks up to some brothel these days. Um, that's what I've been told. <laughs> uh, but someone's working at it smarter than we do. Uh. Well, spreading pollution used to be a liable offense. You were punished for it. And in Rio, two major principles that were watershed principles were created. One was the polluter pays principle, basically saying the polluter's liable. The other was the precautionary principle. Now, in the Monsanto versus Percy case, they basically said the polluter gets paid. And if this logic works, then a company putting toxics into your well doesn't just escape paying you for the pollution, it gets you to hand over your well. And if these kind of decisions go unchallenged, all the instruments that have been created for environmental justice over the last 50 years of people trying to defend life on this planet will be, will be stripped of all those instruments one by one. The precautionary principle was the other major principle, and basically says, when you're not sure about the impact, err on the side of caution. Just the opposite. When you're not sure, rush ahead blindly. And if it doesn't work through scientific argument, and if it doesn't work through reason, and if it doesn't work through democratic decisions, then ram it down their throats. The force feeding of genetically engineered food is one example of that kind of violence. Where not only are people being denied the right to know what's in their food, how it was produced, they're being denied access to information on alternatives. Now, citizens groups have managed to question the first two generations, the first two applications of GM foods, which were basically crops with Bt genes in them and the herbicide-resistant crops. So now the big PR exercise is, of course, around this famous golden rice, which I prefer to call jaundice rice. <laughs> because rice is supposed to become yellow only after you put turmeric in it. <laughs> uh, hundreds of sources of vitamin A exist in the world. In our food in India, we use dhania, daily basis, dhania, batwa, fenugreek, the drumstick, the amaranth, the mango, the papaya, the pumpkin, the poorest of families. You go into the slums in South India, go to Chennai, go to Bangalore, you'll see a drumstick tree in a little tin can, even in a slum. You go into the slums of North India, you'll see a pumpkin creeper. You don't need space. You don't need ownership of land. 
anyone can have these sources of nutrition and vitamin A. And yet, this is precisely what is being totally shut out, even though on all data, whether it's from FAO, WHO, the World Bank itself, UNICEF, shows if in the last 20, 30 years there's been any eradication of vitamin A deficiency. It's basically been by putting seeds of vegetables and fruits in the hands of women who can grow their own fruits, cook them at home, and on the basis of their knowledge and partnership with biodiversity, meet their needs of all the nutrients we need. The golden rice, which is supposed to be this amazing miracle breakthrough, they did a contract with the government of India, which was leaked out to me. As a result of which, I got the basic calculations of how much five years down the line with a lot of development work and millions more dollars being spent, how much vitamin A equivalent they'll be able to produce in this rice. It's 30 micrograms per 100 grams of rice. Now, if you eat the normal amount, which is about 30 grams, you'd meet 1% of your vitamin A requirement. You could meet that with one little leaf of coriander in your curry. Those other sources in, in greens have up to 10,000, 14,000 micrograms per 100 grams. So we're, we're taking a fictitious promise that if it works technologically three, four, five years down the line, we'll be 500% less efficient in providing the nutrition they're trying to offer will, of course, lead to a neglect of those options and therefore a neglect of the rejuvenation and conservation of that diversity. And in addition, crops that can be grown at 200 and 300 millimeters will be replaced by a crop that requires 1,200 millimeters of water. And we're going to aggravate the water scarcity that the Green Revolution has already created. Now, if we were reasonable human beings, we would just say, put all the money that's going into vitamin A rice into the hands of seed banks, community seed banks, north and south, and we'll solve the deficiency problem. But that's where we have financial scarcity. No money for seed banks. Not only no money for seed banks, a terrible dilemma that all this amazing seed diversity could actually also be declared to be an invention, not just Monsanto's Roundup Ready genes in canola, but even the aroma of the basmati that grows in our valley. Basmati, as you know, is this aromatic rice that has this tremendous capacity, you know, it elongates to twice the size of the grain. Um, the aroma doesn't come everywhere. It's not only in the genes, it's a product of the genes and the environment. We take the same seeds, and put them south of the shivalics, and we get no aroma. You grow them in the soils in our valley, the aroma is tremendous. Well, Rice Tech took some of the seeds of basmati from the Fort Collins Gene Bank, did a little ordinary breeding with it, and then claimed a patent 56634684 for the invention, instant invention of novel rice lines, which covered the aroma, the height of the plant, not just an exact height of the plant, but heights of the plant from two feet to four feet. Grain length varying equally much, covering every basmati we have ever grown in the country. Um, the starch quality of the grain, the elongation quality of the grain. Well, you know, we weren't going to take this line down. We weren't going to allow basmati to be treated as an invention. So we started the basmati campaign when the patent was first taken. And last year in April, as a result of the pressure we put through our courts, legal cases, uh, advocacy work with our government, uh, the government mobilized itself and put information out to the US Patent Office that Basmati 370, Type 3, Basmati 433, Basmati 397, all in the collections in India as well as in the collections in the US, had all the traits that Rice Tick was claiming to have invented. On March 27th, something must have been happening around the IPR stars on that last week of March, you know. The judge does something to Percy, and 
but a Europe, uh, US patent office officer, I think, couldn't sleep enough with all the emails that were being bombarded all over the world. We had little old women in Texas chasing rice tech and chasing the US patent office, that the US patent office was rewarding piracy and protecting pirates. And on 27th of March, the US patent office had just mailed a 46-page letter to rice tech saying most of their claims are rejected, except three. <laughs> and in an equally stubborn way, we'd gone on for six years challenging the Neem patent, which is the patent for, the, for this products from this amazing tree that's called the Neem in India and is called as a director indica in scientific language. And the particular patent we challenged was held by W.R. Grace and USDA. And 10th of May last year, that was revoked by the U European Patent Office. So given all the powers that were mobilized and the fact that the corporations, when they got the trade-related intellectual property rights drafted into the WTO, they said, we've achieved something unprecedented. We were the patient, the diagnostician, and the physician all in one, where in this particular case, the patient's running away. <laughs> and for us, each of these issues is at the heart of peace and nonviolence. It's at the heart of ahimsa. It's at the heart of doing no harm. Ahimsa in science and technology traditions, in knowledge traditions, involves first and foremost, in my view, respect for and protection of all of life's diversity. And our ability to think of life's diversity in ways that give, we give space to it in our minds itself, not just on the planet. Because if we close out that space in our mind, we will never leave the space on the Earth. It involves respect and recognition of diverse knowledge systems, not as raw material to be predated on, to be pirated on, but on their own terms, for the communities who have evolved them to meet their needs, to meet their identities. They need not just of food and clothing and shelter and medicine, but the identity as creative communities, which, in my view, is the worst element of biopiracy, because it robs entire aspects, in entire communities in the third world, particularly women, of their ability to be creative, to be innovative, to create knowledge. Respect for biodiversity also entails a shift in production systems, because I think one of the worst elements of the current violence is that it's making the most sustainable, most efficient systems of production non-viable. Not because they are ecologically not viable, not because they are sociologically not viable, not because we don't need good food in our neighborhoods, but because the globalized systems supported by industrialized techniques cannot tolerate their existence. A non-violent agriculture ensures that it does no harm to bees and butterflies and earthworms. When we do workshops with organic farming, we always take a little salt or a little urea. And the farmers who can't see what they're doing to life's organisms in the soil, and they see it above it. Never again will they use urea. It would also, a non-violent system, I believe, is not just not, the, not harming life, but not harming knowledge and truth. Nonviolent systems wouldn't need to falsify facts and data and fabricate analysis of productivity, the safety of biotech products. It would not falsify the productivity of industrial monocultures, which waste water and energy, need chemicals and toxics, and wipe out life's abundance. The violence to knowledge is built into the pseudo-productivity calculus of both the Green Revolution and the Gene Revolution. And without that falseness and violation to knowledge itself, which doesn't allow any kind of practice of science in an independent, free, and totally objective way. You remember the story of Arpad Putsai, the UK scientist who was asked by the UK government to do safety trials with GM potatoes, he did it, 
as a good, honest scientist, as the top lectin expert of the world. He found the results. Deserved to be communicated to the public. The results showed that the rats in this three-month study had brains that had shrunk, pancreas that had enlarged, and immunity systems that had collapsed. And he communicated his scientific results to the public. A gag order was put on him till the parliament was mobilized to have that gag order removed. He basically, as good as, lost his job. They retired him. He wasn't even allowed to talk to his wife about his research. The story in England was that Monsanto called Clinton, Clinton called Blair, Blair called the director, and the director called Arpad. We used to hear such stories around the times of Socrates. The violence to, against independent practitioners, searchers of truth. I remember class three, remember the definition of science? Science is derived from CO. CO is to know the truth. And yet, the truth about what you're studying has no place in a violent knowledge tradition. Well, last year we decided, because of the celebration of nonviolence, to invite Arpad and Percy to India. And we gave Arpad the Gandhi Award for courage to search scientific truth. And we gave Percy, even before this horrible decision came out against him, we gave Percy the award for standing up for farmers' rights and the rights of biodiversity. I am happy that we allowed India's tradition of nonviolence to be honored by amazing people like Harpad and Percy, who in today's world continue to defend traditions of nonviolence, tradition of ahimsa. One of the issues that a tradition of nonviolence must recognize is where does real creativity lie? Where does it come from? And it does not lie in destruction. We have, for more than a century, I believe, been lulled into believing that creative acts are acts of destruction. And that's why we awarded Nobel Prizes to the most destructive chemicals. We continue to award intellectual property rights to products that have no business to exist on this planet, Terminator Technologies, Roundup Ready Seeds. Not just give them monopoly rights, but then allow them through the pollution they spread to own farmers' fields, their crops, their lands, their harvest. We need, once again, to continue what has started here in Seattle. A movement we need to build and strengthen the movement for compassion and caring. A courageous movement it will have to be, because compassion needs courage. It's a movement that must involve the celebration of saving and sharing our knowledge, our seeds, our life spaces, our life support systems. I don't think it takes too much to know that in sharing we are richer and in keeping we are poorer, in preventing others from having every one of us is impoverished. And it's for that deeper abundance and more lasting abundance. I started Navdanya, the seed saving movement in India 14 years ago. That's also the reason now it's time to start the beach with their feet. For these little pools, for a shared culture, for earth citizenship, which I believe will prevail, will last longer, will go beyond the short-term celebrations of fearful violence. Violence that's coming out of a tendency to think that every blade of grass that moves Every bee that flies, every peasant that saves seed, is somehow your enemy. No one is an enemy. Thank you. I'd
questions, if you'd like to um, come up to the microphone. Thank you for speaking here. It's been wonderful. Um, one thing I've tried to do is contact corporations like Pillsbury, Campbell's, uh, Conagra about GM foods in their products. I found a website that said they definitely contain GM products. And uh, they have written back to me form letters basically saying, you know, we don't think GM are bad and they've been tested and tested, blah, blah, blah. So I don't think I'm going to get very far with the corporations, obviously. But uh, I think one thing we could probably push for is legislation to make sure that labeling of GM products happens on food. What do you think of that? Well, a lot of people have been thinking of it, and industry is very clear. They don't want mandatory labeling. They only want voluntary labeling. And labeling is not worth anything if it's not mandatory, and if it's not shaped on the criteria that would satisfy citizens and consumers, and therefore the role of people in deciding what should go into the label. It's an issue that we are having to struggle with a lot now that I don't know how many of you are aware that part of globalization has meant that India has had to remove all trade restrictions on imports from this country. And from 1st of April, anything can come in. And we didn't have too much food processing. We never put things in cans. We ate it fresh. And suddenly, we are having to cope with labeling challenges about what's in our food. And one of the big challenges, and our four ministries are working on it, is how do you guarantee to vegetarians that what they're eating is vegetarian? And even though the normal industry was all ready to accept that, the biotech industry interfered and said this would prevent them from you know, selling stuff with bacteria. I mean, for the Jains, bacteria is non-vegetarian. You know, that's why they keep that cloth. Then they sweep the floor before they walk because they don't want to kill life. Um, I, I think the issue is not just of safety. I don't think we need to say we are worried it might be dangerous. No, we're absolutely safe, but we don't want to eat it. And we have a right to make a choice. I wonder how you feel about, uh, as Americans, I tend to believe that right now we have virtually no control whatsoever over our government regulatory interface with industry. And uh, what would your expectations be long term over the next five to ten years? If we can't do it ourselves, do you, do you see you being able to help in any other way than you are here tonight, right now? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, each time President Bush does the arsenic or whatever he does or the Kyoto, if, I say thank you, President Bush. Um, I say thank you because I think we are going to be all put in the same boat of recognizing that the U.S. was not really living under democratic conditions. Now, you know, that illusion used to cre create real blocks to solidarity because all the wonderful Americans would go around the world and try and fix our governments. Now you'll have enough jobs to do here. <laughs> and now we can all work towards common solutions because I don't think there's any part of the world that will be able to find the future based on sustainability and justice and compassion and caring and peace in isolation. So we'll help you, you help us. The FTAA is happening um, in the Summit of the Americas, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. There's a lot of people um, trying to get into Canada and trying to protest what they are feeling is um, another step um, in the uh, trend towards globalization. And I'm wondering if you could comment in light of your talk tonight about what you see that agreement um, leading us into. Well, um you know more about the FTA than I do. Um, India is not yet part of the free trade of the Americas. You know how they change geography? <laughs> we might in the next year. Um, but meantime, just knowing where these treaties are going, when after went. Um, two things about it. One was the commodification of everything. The second was the false illusion that just because you have free trade, you have no borders. Yeah? 
The Mexicans realize that with NAFTA. The Americans are realizing that with FTAA. And I think all these are extremely good lessons that free trade is about the loss of freedom. And we need to find other strategies for creating real freedom. All I would say is that protest and resistance is strong to the extent that creative, constructive building of alternatives in our everyday lives is also happening. To the extent that protest is fired by that energy, it can carry on, it can be sustainable. And that is why the constructive aspect of ensuring that the energy policies meet the energy needs of the people of each country and the profits of fly-by-night operators, we could call them, couldn't we? Um, that suddenly emerge in the 80s and now rule the energy empires, as do the seed corporations and the biotech corporations, that they do not count more than the people whom they're supposed to serve. And that constructive alternative building is precisely what gets informed by notions of Swaraj, by notions of genuine sovereignty and deepening of democracy in ways that we have not had to experience earlier, but we need to imagine and experience now. Please join me in offering our deepest thanks to Dr. Vandana Shiva this evening. Thank you.